Continuing Artaxerxes from Plutarch's Lives, translated by John Dryden, revised by Arthur de Clough. But when all his attempts to capture the Greeks that had come with Cyrus, though he desired to do so no less than he had desired to overcome Cyrus and maintain his throne, proved unlucky, and they, though they had lost both Cyrus and their own generals, nevertheless escaped, as it were, out of his very palace, making it plain to all men that the Persian king and his empire were mighty indeed in gold and luxury and women, but otherwise were a mere show and vain display. Upon this all, Greece took courage and despised the barbarians, and especially the Lacedaemonians thought it strange if they should now deliver their countrymen that dwell in Asia from their subjugation to the Persians, nor put an end to the contemplious usage of them. And first, having an army under the conduct of Thimbron, then under Dercalidas, but doing nothing memorable, they at last committed the war to the management of their king, Agesilaus, who, when he had arrived with his men in Asia, as soon as he had lauded, uh, as soon as he had landed them, fell actively to work and got himself very great renown. He defeated Tisphernes in a pitched battle and set many cities in revolt. Upon this. Artaxerxes, perceiving what was his wisest way of waging war, sent Timocrates, the Rhodian, into Greece with large sums of gold, commanding him, by a free distribution of it, to corrupt the leading men in the cities and to excite a Greek war against Sparta. So Timocrates, following his instructions, the most considerable cities conspiring together, and the Peloponnesus being in disorder. The ephors remanded Agesilaus from Asia, at which time they say, as he was upon his return, he told his friends that Artaxerxes had driven him out of Asia with 30,000 archers, the Persian coin having an archer stamped upon it. Now, politicians are people involved in politics really do operate according to whatever their belief system is. And if that belief system is, well, if the government gives me this, I'll, I'll favor their um, their evils, right? Or the politicians, oh, if I, if I get enough popularity or corporate sponsorship and... Because, um, like right now, people are pretending, oh, no, people are... Of this belief, it's like, well, yeah, they're going to operate their beliefs in office, you know. It's going to happen. Um, Artaxerxes scoured the seas, too, of the Lacedaemonians, Canaan, the Athenian, and Barnabasus, being his admirals. For Canaan, after the Battle of Agaspotami, resided in Cyprus. Not that he consulted his own mere security, but looking for the vicissitude of affairs with no less hope than men wait for a change of wind at sea, and perceiving that his skill wanted power, and that the king's power wanted a wise man to guide it, he sent him an account of his projects and charged the bearer to hand it to the king, if possible, by the mediation of Zeno, the Cretan, or Polycritus, the Mendan, the former being a dancing master, the latter a physician, or in the absence of them both by Catesius, who is said to have taken Canaan's letter and foisted into the contents of it a request that the king would also be pleased to send over Catesius to him, who was likely to be of use on the sea coast. Catesius, however, declares that the king of his accord deputed him to his service. Artaxerxes, however, defeating the Lacedaemonians in a sea flight at Cnidas, under the conduct of Barnabasus and Conan, 
after he had stripped them of their sovereignty by sea, at the same time brought, so to say, the whole of Greece over to him, so that upon his own terms he dictated the celebrated peace among them, styled the peace of Antokidas this. Antokidas was a Spartan, the son of one Leon, who, acting for the king's interest, induced the Lacedaemonians to covenant to let all the Greek cities in Asia and the islands adjacent to it become subject and tributary to him. Peace being among these conditions established among the Greeks, if indeed the honorable name of peace can fairly be given to what in fact, the disgrace and betrayal of Greece, a treaty more inglorious than had ever been the result of any war to those defeated in it. And therefore Artaxerxes, though always abominating other Spartans and looking upon them, as Dinan says, to be the most impudent men living, gave wonderful honor to Antokidas when he came to him into Persia so much that one day, taking a garland of flowers and dipping it in the most precious ointment, he sent it to him after supper, a favor which all were amazed at. Indeed, he was a person fit to be thus delicately treated, and to have such a crown, who had among the Persians. Thus made fools of Leonidas and Calicratidas, Agesilaus, it seems, on someone having said, O oh, the deplorable fate of Greece, now the Spartans turn Medes, replied, Nay, rather, it is the Medes who become Spartans. But the subtlety of the repartee did not wipe off the infamy of the action. The Lacedaemonians soon after lost their sovereignty in Greece by their defeat at Leuctra, but they had already lost their honor by this treaty so long then as Sparta continued to be the first state in Greece, Artaxerxes, continued to Antokidas the honor of being called his friend and his guest, but when routed and humbled at the Battle of Leuctra, being under great distress for money, they had dispatched Agesilaus into Egypt, and Antokidas went up to Artaxerxes, beseeching him to supply their necessities. He so despised, slighted, and rejected him, that finding himself on his return, Mocked and insulted by his enemies, and fearing also the ephors, he starved himself to death. Ismenias, also, the Theban and Pelopidas, who had already gained the victory at Leuctra, arrived at the Persian court, where the latter did nothing unworthy of himself. But Ismenias, being commanded to do obeisance to the king, dropped his ring before him upon the ground, and so stooping to take it up, made a show of doing him homage. He was so gratified with some secret intelligence with which Timocoras, the Athenian, sent in to him by the hand of his secretary, Belurius, that he bestowed upon him ten thousand darks, and, because he was ordered, on account of some sickness, to drink cow's milk, there were fourscore milch kine driven after him. Why in the world would you need 80 cows? Um, one would be all a person could drink, right? Um, also, he sent him a bed, furniture, and servants for it, the Grecians not having silk enough to make it, as also chairman to carry him. Well, maybe if you wanted to bathe in it or something. Um, being infirm in body to the seaside, not to mention the feast made for him at court, which, so princely and splendid, that Astenus, the king's brother, said to him, O oh, Timagoras, do not forget the sumptuous table you have set at here. It was not put before you for nothing, which was indeed rather a reflection upon the, his treason than to remind him of the king's beauty, and indeed the Athenians condemned Timagoras to death for taking bribes. But Artaxerxes gratified the Grecians, 
in one thing, in lieu of the many wherewith he plagued them. And that was by taking off Tisiphernes, their most hated and malicious enemy, whom he put to death. Parasetes, adding her influence to the charges made against him, for the king did not persist long in the wrath with his mother, but was reconciled to her, and sent for her, being assured that she had wisdom and courage fit for royal power, and there being now no cause discernible but that they might converse together without suspicion or offense, and from thenceforward, humoring the king in all things according to his heart's desire, and finding fault with nothing that he did, she obtained great power with him, and was gratified in all her requests. She perceived he was desperately in love with Atossa, one of his own two daughters, and that he concealed and checked his passion chiefly for fear of herself, though if we may believe some writers, he had privately given way to it with the young girl already, as soon as Parasati suspected it, she displayed a great fondness for the young girl than before, and extolled both her virtue and beauty to him as being truly imperial and majestic, and fine, she persuaded him to marry her and declare her to be his lawful, ripe, uh, his lawful wife, overriding all the principles and the laws by which the Greeks hold themselves bound in regarding him self as divinely appointed for a law to the Persians and the supreme arbiter as divinely appointed for a law to the Persians and the supreme arbiter of good and evil. Well... People are always, well, not always, but, you know, most people are taking um, something other than God. It's their, like, Lord, really. Um, like, uppercase Lord, you know. Um, not, you know, Lord and Lady and Spiritual Master and that sort of stuff, but, you know. Um, and Nietzsche definitely warned about the idol of the state. You know, nihilism would do that. Um, of course, we have the mythical monsters and the... Um, I, I mean, I include aliens among, amongst that, but... Um, and, and, you know, the celebrity. You know, MTV had a show back in the day called Fanatic. And it really fit that, you know. Because these people were obsessed with the person not so much the principle or, you know, the message in the art. But some historians further affirm in which number is Heraclides of Kuma, that Artaxerxes married not only this one, but a second daughter also, a mestris of whom we shall speak by and by. But he so loved Atossa when she became his consort, that when leprosy had run through her whole body, he was not in the least offended at it, but putting up his prayers to Juno for her, to this one alone of all deities, he made obeisance. Yeah, Juno's like Jupiter, right? By, you know, and it's not always too um, faced Jupiter, but by laying his hands upon the earth, and his satraps and favorites made such offerings to the female entity by his direction that all long for sixteen furlongs betwixt the court and her temple the road was filled up with gold and silver purple and horses devoted to her he waged war out of his own kingdom with the egyptians under the conduct of phronobazus and Iphicrates, but was unsuccessful by reason of their dissensions in his expedition against the Cadassians, he went himself in person with three hundred thousand footmen and ten thousand horse, making an incursion into their country, which was so mountainous as scarcely to be passable, and with all very misty, producing no sort of harvest of corn, you know, grain, of whatever sort, or the like, but with pears, apples, and other tree fruits feeding a warlike and valiant breed of men. He unawares fell under great distresses and dangers, for there was nothing to be got fit for his men to eat, 
of the growth of that place, nor could anything be imported from any other. All they could do was to kill their beasts of burden, and thus a donkey's head could scarcely be bought for sixty drachmas. Bought for sixty drachmas. Well, often there's food all over the place. It's just people don't know from one place to the other. Um, in short, the king's own table failed, and there were but few horses left. The rest they had spent for food. Then Teribasis, a man often in great favor with his prince or his valor, and as often out of it or his buffoonery, and particularly at that time, in humble estate and neglected, was the deliverer of the king and his army, there being two kings amongst the, the Cadassians, and each of them encamping separately. Teribasis, after he had made his application to Artaxerxes, he imparted his design to him, went to one of the princes, and sent away his son privately to the other. So each of them deceived his man, assuring him that the other prince had deputed an ambassador to Artaxerxes, suing for friendship and alliance for himself alone, and therefore, if he were wise, he told him he must apply himself to his master before he had decreed anything, and he, he said, would lend him his assistance in all things. Both of them gave credit to these words, and because they supposed they were each intrigued against by the other, they both sent their envoys, one along with Teribasis and the other with his son, all this taking some time to transact fresh surmises and suspicions of Teribasis were expressed to the king, who began to be out of heart, sorry that he had confided in him and ready to give ear to his rivals, who impeached him, but at last he came. And so did his son, bringing the Cadassian agents along with them. And so there was a cessation of arms and a peace signed with both the princes, and Teribasis, in great honor and distinction, set out homewards in the company of the king, who indeed upon this journey made it appear publicly and plainly that cowardice and effeminacy are the effects, not of delicate and sumptuous living, as many suppose, but of a base and vicious nature, actuated by false and bad opinions. Now we see that one group that people are saying is harmless is actually uh, more prone to certain violence and stuff, but, um, you know, different types of violence. For, notwithstanding his golden ornaments, his robe of state, and the rest of that costly attire, worth no less than 12,000 talents, with which the royal person was constantly clad, his labors and toils were not a whit inferior to those of the meanest persons in his army. With his quiver by his side, and his shield on his arm, he led them on foot, quitting his horse, through craggy and steep ways, insomuch that the sight of his cheerfulness and unwearied strength gave wings to the soldiers and so lightened the journey that they made daily marches of above two hundred furlongs. After they had arrived at one of his own mansions, which had beautiful ornamented parks in the midst of a region, naked and without trees, the weather being very cold, he gave full commission to his soldiers to provide themselves with the wood by cutting down any without exception, even the pine and cypress. And when they hesitated, and were for sparing them, being large and goodly trees, he, taking up an axe himself, felled the greatest and most beautiful of them, after which his men used their hatchets, and piling up many fires, passed away the night at their ease. Nevertheless, he returned not with the loss of many and valiant subjects, of almost all his horses, and supposing that his misfortunes and the ill success of his expedition made him despised in the eyes of his people. He looked jealously on his nobles, many of whom he slew in anger and yet more out of fear, as indeed fear is the bloodiest passion in princes, confidence, on the other hand, being merciful, gentle, and, unsuspic and unsuspicious, we see among wild beasts 
the intractable and least tameable are the most timorous and most easily startled. The nobler creatures whose courage makes them trustful are ready to respond to the advances of men. You know, pushing them forward, basically. You know, Arctic Xerxes. Now being, well, I mean, you know, going forward, you know, um, Arctic Xerxes, now being an old man, perceived that his sons were in controversy about his kingdom and that they made parties among his favorites and peers. Those that were equitable among them thought it fit that as he had received it, so he should bequeath it by right of age to Darius. The younger brother, Aucas, who was hot and violent, and indeed a considerable number of the courtiers that espoused his interest, but his chief hope was that by Atossa's means he should win his father, for he flattered her with thoughts of being his wife and partner in the kingdom after the death of Artaxerxes. And truly it was rumored that already Aucas maintained a too intimate correspondence with her. This, however, was quite unknown to the king, who, being willing to put down in good time his son Ox's hopes, lest, by his attempting the same things his uncle Cyrus did, wars and contentions might again afflict his kingdom, proclaimed Darius, then twenty-five years old, his successor, and gave him leave to wear the upright hat, as they called it. It was a rule and usage of Persia that the heir apparent to the crown should beg a boon, and that he that declared him so sh should give whatever he asked, provided it were within the sphere of his power. Darius therefore requested Aspasia, in former time the most prized of the concubines of Cyrus, and now belonging to the king, she was by birth a Fakaan of Aonia, born of free parents and well-educated once, when Cyrus was at supper, she was led to him with other women, who, when they were set down by him, and he began to sport and dally and talk jestingly with them, gave way freely to his advances. But she stood by in silence, refusing to come when Cyrus called her, and when his chamberlains were going to force her towards him, said, Whosoever lays hands on me shall rue it, so that she seemed to the company a sullen and rude-mannered person. However, Cyrus was so pleased and laughed, saying to the man that brought the woman, Do you not see to a certainty that this woman alone of all that came with you is truly noble and pure in character? After which time he began to regard her and loved her above all of her sex, and called her the wise. But Cyrus being slain in the fight, she was taken among the spoils of his camp. Darius, in demanding her, no doubt much offended his father, for the barbarian people keep a very jealous and watchful eye over their carnal pleasures, so that it is death for a man not only to come near and touch any concubine of his prince, but likewise on a journey to ride forward and pass by the carriages in which they are conveyed. And though, to gratify his passion, he had against all law married his daughter, Atossa, and had besides her no less than three hundred and sixty concubines selected for their beauty, yet, being importuned for that one by Darius, urged that she was a free woman, and allowed him to take her, if she had an inclination to go with him, but by no means to force her way, uh, her away against it. You know, hopefully, New Jersey has finally outlawed incest. Um, some places you can marry cousins. That's not really incest, but it's something to be careful of. Um, but uncle or the aunt or something like that that's yeah that shouldn't be allowed either um several states were like that 
which goes to show you just can't look at the law of the state and say, well, that's right, that's wrong, and yeah, no. Aspasia, therefore being sent for, and contrary to the king's expedition, uh, the king's expectation, making choice of Darius, gave him her indeed being constrained by law, but when he had done so a little after, he took her from him. For he consecrated her priestess to Diana of Ecbatana, whom they named Anaitis, that she might spend the remainder of her days in strict chastity, thinking thus to punish his son, not rigorously, but with moderation, by a revenge checkered with jest and earnest. But he took it heinously, either that he was passionately fond of Aspasia, or because he looked upon himself as affronted and scorned by his father. Terry Bassus, perceiving him thus, Reminded, did his best to exasperate him yet further, seeing in his injuries a representation of his own, of which the following is the account. Artaxerxes, having many daughters, promised to give a Pema to Parnabasis to wife, Rodogun to Arantes, and Amestris to Teribasis, whom alone of the three he disappointed by marrying Amestris himself. However, to make him amends, he betrothed his youngest daughter, Atossa, to him. But after he had, being enamored of her too, as has been said, married her, Teribasis entertained an irreconcilable enmity against him, as indeed he was seldom at any other time steady in his temper, but uneven and inconsiderate, so that whether he were in the number of the choicest favorites of his prince, or whether he were offensive and odious to him, he demeaned himself in neither condition with moderation. But if he was advanced, he would, and he was intolerably insolent, and in his degradation, not submissive and peaceful in his deportment, but fierce and haughty. And therefore, Terry Bazas was the young prince flame added upon flame, ever urging him and saying that, in vain, those wear their hats upright who consult not the real successes of their affairs, and that he was ill-befriended of reason, if he imagined, whilst he had a brother, who through the women's apartments was seeking a way to the supremacy, and a father of so rash and fickle a humor that he should, by succession, infallibly step up into the throne. For he that out of fondness to an Ionian girl, by that I presume young woman, has eluded a law sacred and, and <clears throat> sacred and inviolable among the Persians, is not likely to be faithful in the performance of the most important promises. He added too that it was not all for one for Aucus to attain to, and for him to be put by his crown, since Aucus, as a subject, might live happily, and nobody could hinder him. But he, being proclaimed king, must either take up his scepter, or lay down his life. These words presently inflame Darius, what Sophocles says, being indeed generally true. Quick travels the persuasion to what's wrong, for the path is smooth, and upon an easy descent that leads us to our own will, and the most part of us desire what is evil through our strangeness to an ignorance of good, and in this case, no doubt, the greatness of the empire and the jealousy Darius had of Aucus furnished Teribasis with material for his persuasions, nor was Venus wholly unconcerned in the matter, in regard namely of his loss of Aspasia. Darius, therefore, resigned himself up to the dictates of Teribasis, and, many now conspiring with them, a eunuch gave information to the king of their plot, and the way how it was to be managed, having discovered the certainty of it, that they had resolved to break into his bedchamber by night, and there to kill him as he lay. After Artaxerxes had been thus advertised, he did not think fit 
by disregarding the discovery to dispose so great a danger, nor to believe it when there was little or no proof of it. Thus, then he did, he charged the eunuch constantly to attend and accompany the conspirators wherever they were. In the meanwhile, he broke down the party wall of the chamber behind his bed and placed a door in it to open and shut, which he covered up with tapestry. So the hour approaching and the eunuch having told him the precise time in which the traitors designed to assassinate him, he waited for them in his bed and rose not up till he had seen the faces of his assailants and recognized every man of them. But as soon as he saw them with their swords drawn and coming up to him, throwing up the hanging, he made his retreat into the inner chamber and bolting the door, raised a cry. Thus, when the murderers had been seen by him and had attempted him in vain, they with speed went back. Through the same doors they came in by, enjoining Taribasis and his friends to fly, as their plot had been certainly detected. They therefore made their escape different ways, but Taribasis was seized by the king's guards, and after slaying many, while they were laying hold on him, at length being struck through with a dart at a distance, fell. As for Darius, who was brought to trial with his children, the king appointed the royal judges to sit over him, and because he was not himself present, but accused Darius by proxy, he commanded his scribes to write down the opinion of every one of the judges and show it to him. And after they had given their sentences, all as one man, and condemned Darius to death, the officers seized on him and hurried him to a chamber not far off, to which place the executioner, when summoned, came with a razor in his hand, with which men of his employment cut off the heads of offenders. But when he saw that Darius was the person thus to be punished, he was appalled and started, and started back, offering to go out as one that had neither power nor courage enough to behead a king. Yet at the threats and commands of the judges who stood at the prison door, he returned and grasping the hair of his head and bringing his face to the ground with one hand, he cut through his neck with the razor he had in the other, some firm that sentence was passed in the presence of Artaxerxes that Darius, after he had been convicted by clear evidence, falling prostrate before him, did humbly beg his pardon, that instead of giving it, he, rising up in rage, and drawing a scimitar, smote him till he had killed him, and then, going forth into the court, he worshipped the sun, and said, Depart in peace, ye Persians, and declare to your fellow subjects how the mighty Oromastes hath dealt out vengeance to the contrivers of unjust and unlawful things. And I presume they mean Ahuramasta. So basically, you know, God has done this. Um, such, then, was the issue of this conspiracy. And now Aucus was high in his hopes, being confident in the influence of Atossa, and yet was afraid of Ariaspes, the only male surviving besides himself of the legitimate offspring of his father, and of Arsamas, one of his natural sons, for indeed Ariaspes was already claimed as their prince by the wishes of the Persians, not because he was the elder brother, but because he excelled Aucus in gentleness, plain dealing and good nature, and on the other hand, Arsames appeared by his wisdom, fitted for the throne, that he was dear to his father Aucus, well known. So he laid snares for them both, and, being no less treacherous than bloody, he made use of the cruelty of his nature against Arsames, and of his craft and willingness against Ariaspes. For he suborned the king's eunuchs and favorites to convey him menacing and harsh expressions from his father as though he had decreed to put him to cruel and ignominious death when they daily communicated these things as secrets and told him at one time that the king would do so to him ere long and at another that the blow was actually close and pending they so alarmed the young man struck such a terror into him 
and cast such a confusion and anxiety upon his thoughts that having prepared some poisonous drugs, he drank them, and he might be delivered from his life. The king, on hearing what kind of death he died, heartily lamented him, and was not without a suspicion of the cause of it, but being disabled by his age to search into and prove it, he was, after the loss of this son, more affectionate than before to Arsimus, and did manifestly place his greatest confidence in him, and made him privily to his counsels, whereupon Ocus had no longer patience to defer the execution of his purpose, but having procured Arpatus, Teribas's his son, for the undertaking, he killed Arsemus by his hand. Artaxerxes at that time had but a little hold on life by reason of his extreme age, and so, when he heard of the fate of Arsemus, he could not sustain it at all, but sinking at once under the weight of his grief and distress, expired after a life of ninety-four years and a reign of sixty-two, and then he seemed a moderate and gracious governor, more especially as compared to his son Ocus, who outdid all his predecessors in bloodthirstiness and cruelty. And well, I guess that's one of the things you would do is you'd You'd, you'd want that extra communication. It's like, make funny faces at him, too. No, I'm yeah, I, I, I guess I've heard of similar things. Not, not, you know, not take this guy to prison, all this other stuff, but, you know, 